Well, if you were here during Legacy, you know that we shared with you that some amazingly generous men in our church have gathered together a group called the Founders Group, and they, to help us continue to expand all of our churches and open even new churches, they put together a $3 million matching grant for the next three years. Let me tell you what that means. Every year, we as a congregation match that $3 million. We get their $3 million, and that's $6 million. And so the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to open up our Savior's Church of Ville Platte. <clears throat> um, I, I spoke in Opelousas last week, and I'm going to tell you, there was over 2,000 people there in the three services. And when you look at it, it's right on the highway. How many of you know where it is? There is so many people coming off of that highway into that building. You think that we're giving away food, money, or crack cocaine. I mean, it's just, it's astounding just watching what God, 25% of Opelousas calls our Savior's church their home church. And when you see it's 50% black, 50% white, the richest of the rich, the poorest of the poor, I am so grateful that we get the privilege of starting churches that look like heaven. So uh, I made mention to you a couple of weeks ago, they just listed the 10 worst cities in Louisiana to live in. We have churches at four of them because wherever it's the darkest, that's where they need the light. I'm glad that the government can give up on you, but God still does it. And so we are, we are going to open up there, re renovate that building, and then we're going to expand Abbeville. Abbeville campus, when we got it, had 40 to 50 people. The first Sunday, there was 400 people. And it's settled down to about 300 now, but it seats 250. So we're going to expand there and prepare for the future. And then, of course, the Lafayette campus has grown over 1,000 people in the last 10 months. L let me help you. This building seats jam-packed 1,000 people. That means there's probably 800 people there, 150 children in one part, 50 children in the nursery area. Last weekend at this service, we had 1,700 people. Okay, that, that's just like, so how many parked on the grass? I know, the grass, now the mud. Um, so we're going to expand all the parking all the way around. We're going to add extra nursery, children's space, an overflow that seats 400 people, and it's going to be it's going to be amazing. And then our final project is going to be going into the third and fourth year, and that will be Youngsville, and that's pretty exciting. I mean, how many of you have seen our property that we have for Youngsville? We have 20 beautiful acres right off Shemin Metairie and Fortune Road. And uh, that's ultimately, that will be the last final project. But we're about 85% of the way through to our first $3 million match. So we're at about 2.6 million. We're, we're about $300,000, $350,000 short. So just keep praying with us. Listen, how many of you never came to our Savior's Church till you came into this building? Raise your hand. Do you know, look around, keep all those hands up. Do you know why you're here? Because people in Broussard were willing to sacrifice to have a building for you to be in today. So I am just so excited about all of that. And of course, on our Easter services, mamas, every mama, look at me. At Easter, your children call you and say, mama, what do you want us to do? You get that asked twice. It's Easter's, I mean, excuse me. Yeah, it's Easter and it's Mother's Day. And you know what the answer is? Well, what, what do you want, Mama? Okay, let me try that one more time, Mamas. I'm going to help you. Mama, what do you want? Come to church with me. And I promise you, look at me. We'll make sure they cry. <laughs> that they recognize they need Jesus. And we'll do everything we can to be an answer to your, to your prayers. An answer to your prayers. Well, in, uh, in the last service, uh, one, of, one of the exciting announcements we have is we just um, sold a piece of property in Opelousas, uh, where, where our campus is. We have 120 acres there, and we just sold a piece of property to Helix Academy, which is, joins the church parking lot. They are going to build the newest school built in St. Landry Parish in 60 years. In 15 months, 600 students 
K to 5 will be going there. You know why they built it there? Because they wanted us to minister in the school. How cool is it that they're spending millions of dollars building the newest school so that we can minister there? The next year, they're going to add three more grades, sixth to ninth, the next year, all the way through high school. And before it's over, in four years, the largest school in St. Landry Parish will be in our church parking lot, and we'll be ministering there and serving those students right there. Uh, Preston Castile, who is the head of Helix Academy, is here. He's on the Bessie board, which oversees all the public schools in the state of Louisiana. And you are a part of all of that. So uh, be praying with us about who you're going to bring to bring with you. And then I want to also mention, and finally, you know, the, the, the book that Michelle wrote is an amazing book. Um, and, and I want to challenge you. It's, it's, it's a great, great book for you to sit there and read your children. We actually have most of the books that Michelle read to our children. Jacob Jr., who's 40, we have most of them now. And Joseph and Christian are now reading them to their children. So this is a great, great book that's going to bless you in a great way. And that's, that's right outside if you're interested in that. Well, we're in a new series. Um, and in this series, we've been talking about tables and people that ultimately will end up at the Last Supper, the Lord's Table, or the final Passover. But I want to talk to you about one of the apostles today that probably a lot of us wonder, how did he become an apostle? Like, how, how did he get to be around Jesus? But many of us aren't sure of all the names of each of the 12 apostles listed in here or the support group that Jesus had. It was about 70 people that surrounded Jesus and his ministry. We do know about the apostle I want to speak about today. He was raised in a devout Jewish family in Kirith, a humble town just south of Judea. His name means praise the Lord or Jehovah leads us. He was the only one of the 12 who was not from the region of Galilee where Jesus chose his other disciples. That was a fishing town like Delcom. His name is mentioned in each of the recordings of the 12 apostles, but it's always mentioned last. Some might find it hard to believe, but he was the most educated. In other words, he went to Ascension. That being said, you can see why he was made the treasurer. He was smart. He had a good business mind, more educated than the others who came from humble fishing towns. This apostle participated in the miracles of the loaves and the fishes when the disciples were, were told, here, take these baskets and start feeding people after Jesus prayed over two fish and a couple of loaves, and, and they began to multiply till he fed 5,000, if you know the story, at the end, there was 12 basketfuls left over, so he had a basketful to eat for himself. He saw Jesus walk on water. He saw him cast out demons. He saw him raise the dead when they went to Lazarus, his best friends, and, and he showed up four days late to a funeral, and he'd already been dead, and Jesus raised him from the dead. He saw him heal lepers. He saw blind Bartimaeus, the beggar, get up and be able to see. He heard the Sermon on the Mount. He watched as Jesus preached the greatest messages ever preached, and he assisted the apostles, casting out demons, healing the sick, and doing miracles. How, how could all of this start so well and yet end so terribly? The apostle I'm speaking of, you probably know, is Judas. Judas. I'm sure you're wondering why I devote an entire sermon to someone who's such a terrible example. It was Charles Barkley, the great NBA Hall of Famer, who when he was reminded about 25 years ago, hey man, you need to watch the way you act when you play because you, you're an example. People are watching you. He boisterously said, I'm no example. I'm no role model. But he was wrong. Everyone's a role model. They're either a role model of what to become or what not to become. A role model of what to do or what not to do. Everyone is some sort of an example. So how did Judas become Judas? How could someone live with Jesus for three years? How could they participate in the miracles? How could they hear the greatest sermons ever preached? How could they, they watch even the things that we don't know about? John tells us this in John 21, verse 25. 
Jesus did countless things that I haven't even included here in the book of John. For if every one of the works were written down and described one by one, I suppose the whole world itself wouldn't have enough room to contain what? All the books that are written. So we know some of the miracles, but he tells us there's many, many more we don't even have a clue about. Judas' words are recorded in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He makes three statements, and today I'm going to remind you of one I spoke about a couple of weeks ago. This is Judas's first statement. It's in John chapter 12, six days before Jesus is to be crucified. There is a meal in his honor. Six days before the Passover began, Jesus went back to Bethany, the town where he raised Lazarus from the dead. And they prepared a supper for Jesus, and Martha was there. Martha is Lazarus' sister. And Lazarus and Mary were also at the table. Mary, again, his sister, Lazarus' sister, who'd been raised from the dead. Mary picked up the alabaster jar filled with neither a liter of extremely rare and costly perfume with the purest extract in nard, and she anointed Jesus feet. She wouldn't even use a towel. Instead, she loosed her long hair to dry his feet with, and the fragrance of the costly oil filled the house. But Judas, the one in charge of the money, he had the key to the lock where the money was in a box. Simon's son, the betrayer, spoke up and said, what a waste. We could have sold this perfume for a fortune and given the money to the poor. In fact, Judas had no heart for the poor. He only said this because he was a thief in charge of the money. He would steal money whenever he wanted money from the funds given to support Jesus' ministry. And Jesus looked at Judas and said, have you ever been corrected? Remember when you were a kid and you got called out by the teacher in class? Remember how you went all red and felt heat all over your body? Imagine sitting at the most important table of all times. A man that's been raised from the dead for four days is sitting there. A leper who's been cleansed is sitting there. And Jesus himself, and a woman is pouring out this incredible worship. She's taken a year's worth of perfume. It would take a year's worth of wages to, to buy it. And she's pouring it out over his feet. He says, what a waste. And then Jesus begins to scold him and correct him. And Judah Jesus said to Judas, leave her alone. She has saved this for my burial. You will always have the poor with you, but you won't always have me with you. Now, Mark gives us another account and tells us another detail that John did not include, an important one, the same story. And while he was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, he was reclining at the table and a woman with an alabaster flask of ointment, a pure nard, very costly. She broke the flask and poured it over his, remember, John talked about it being at his feet. She talks about it being at his head. In other words, she poured it all over him. And there were some who said to themselves indignantly, why? Say it with me. Said what? Why? One more time. Why? Remember, that's really important. Why was this ointment wasted? For the ointment could have been sold for more money than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And he scolded her. He includes another part. Not only did, did he say what a waste, he actually scolds the woman. And Jesus said, leave her alone. Why are you causing her trouble? She has done a beautiful thing for me. For you always have the poor with you whenever you want. You can give them whatever good will you ever do for them, but you will not always have me with you. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for burial. And let me just remind you this. Theologians tell us six days later, Jesus would be crucified. Theologians tell us that this ointment was so expensive that the smell of what she poured on him still could be smelled on the cross six days later. Wherever this gospel is preached, Jesus said it will be proclaimed with the whole world what she's done. Verse 10, read it with me. Then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the, went to the chief priest in order to betray him. What was the final straw for Judas? Well, what was the final thing that caused him to get to such a place that he became so upset that he said, that's it. This is the final straw. 
in spite of the miracles, in spite of the healings, in spite of all the things that I've witnessed and seen, in spite of all that I've seen Jesus do that I know the only explanation for was heaven and the miraculous. This is the final straw. Jesus called him out publicly. You ever been called out? You ever been embarrassed in front of people because you did something stupid? Okay. You know what happens when that happens to you? You get your feelings hurt. You get offended. You get wounded. Mark includes the fact that this was the final thing. And he connects this to this final act of worship. This woman pouring things out. Isn't it amazing how people still have the same complaint? All church wants is, that's all they care about is, I don't why, you know why I don't go to church? I don't go to church because all they want is, now do those people still go to the mall? Do they still go to Target? Huh, with their transgender bathrooms. Do, 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 they, do they still get online to Amazon? Do they still get on the internet when it tries to pop up stuff that you didn't even know you needed that you now need because it just popped up on Instagram? Answer? But none of them said, go, you go to the mall? I'm not going to the mall. All they want is my money. You want to go to Cain's? I don't want to go to Cain's. All they want to do is clog up my arteries and take my money. I don't. It's only about spiritual things. You know why? Look at me. Generosity is a spirit, but greed is a spirit too. Greed is a spirit too. How many of you know some greedy people? You know what greed is? Greed is when you're generous to yourself, but you're stingy with other people. Generosity is when you're stingy with yourself and generous with people. That was a whole lot better than your response, but I, I, I'm, I'm still good. <laughs> Abbeville, I know you love that. I know you're clapping right now at Abbeville. I appreciate that. Okay. Why did he become Judas? How does someone become a Judas? First, let me ask you. Have any of you here ever been betrayed? Have any of you ever had someone that, that, that you loved and, 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 and you saw? I mean, here's the path to betrayal. I want to give it to you. The first one is you choose someone to come close to you. Like, like you tell them secrets. You tell them stuff that you don't tell other people. You surely wouldn't tell your enemies. And you, you share your heart with them. and You tell them areas of your strengths and areas of your weakness and and things you like, and things you're embarrassed of, and you get chosen to come close, and then you get intimacy and influence in someone's life. I mean, like you trust them. Like, like you share the treasures of your heart with them. And then something goes wrong. You get offended. Say that with me, offended. Offended. Jesus said, it is impossible for you to go through life and not be offended. Have any of you ever had a friend hurt you? Do you know however much you love someone, that's how much they can hurt you? Hurt is measured by love and intimacy. If it's someone who you really shared your heart with, man, they can really hurt you. They can really hurt you. And so you're you're offended, and then you're, you're hurt, and, and you hold on to that hurt, and it becomes unforgiveness, and, and that unforgiveness becomes resentment. And now, what was just a disappointment is now you're disillusioned with them. They're not only not your best friend, they're not your friend. Has this happened to anybody here besides me? And then... The unthinkable happens. It's one thing for them just to reject you or you to reject them and say, okay, you're no longer going to be close to me. I'm no longer going to hang out with you. You're not going to be invited as one of my BFFs to everything. But then they do the unthinkable. 
Because all of us have done that. How many of you have been hurt by people and you just withdrew? Raise your hand. Okay, of course we all have. But in order to be a Judas, it goes beyond that. Because then you take what you got through friendship, intimacy, love, openness, and you take that and you go to their greatest enemy. You see, the word betray means to take what you received over here that you could only get through friendship and intimacy and you take it and you give it to someone they would never give that access to or never give that information to. That's betrayal. That's Judas. That's Judas. I'm going to ask you another question. How many of you have ever betrayed someone yourself? So today, I want to show you the steps of how Judas became Judas so we can make sure to learn from his mistakes that we don't repeat them in our lives. I, I, I say this often. If you've been around me very much, and I, I've counseled you, about, I say this often. I don't always know what God wants me to do. Like sometimes people go, well, what decision should I make? I mean, if it's a clear right or wrong decision, it's easy, Okay. I want to beat them up. Okay, be kind to them. I want to kill them. Okay, put your gun up. Okay, I mean, I, I, that's easy. That's easy stuff. Okay. But watch this. Sometimes there's decisions and you really don't know. Anybody know what I'm talking about? So here's my motto that has helped me through moments like that. I don't always know what God wants me to do. But if I know what the devil wants me to do, I'm going to do the opposite. Like if you're driving, somebody, you get mad at somebody, you go, man, they need a good cussing. That's what they need. You need to punch them out. And, okay, I know that, it, <laughs> does God want me to do that? Okay, some of y'all are going, I feel that. Yes, Lord. <laughs> no, does God want me to do that? So I'm going to do the exact opposite. I'm going to be gracious and I'm going to be kind. I'm going to bless those who curse me. I'm going to do good to those who despitefully use me. Okay. Have you ever been with somebody who's just like tight financially? Like, I mean, tight. I mean, tight. Old school, they say they squeeze a nickel till the buffalo squeals. <laughs> you have to be old to know what a buffalo nickel is. You know people that are just tight? Like, they don't pay for nothing. I mean, they reach for that into their pocket. It's like, like... A gate, a hundred years old, so tight. I mean, you know people like that. I never let those people pay for anything for me. Never. I don't care if I got a charge on a card I don't have money on. I'd rather hear them go, beep, beep, beep. I'm sorry, it didn't work out, but there's something wrong with the card. Come on, don't act like you haven't done that. And 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 I I, I mean I I I will because. I know that, that they, in their mind is they think everybody's about to, you know, people like that, everybody's trying to take money from me. Everybody, everybody. And, and you know why they hold on to it? Because they believe that they're the source. I can be generous because God is my source, not somebody else. That's why true generosity is being stingy with yourself and generous to other people because Jesus' words are true. He said, it's better to give than to receive. It's better to give. Science has now proven that when you give to others, literally there is endorphins released inside you. Isn't it amazing that God made you to live the way that he made you to live, and when you do what's right, you actually are releasing endorphins inside of you that make you feel good? You know, when people walk up and they go, hey, I don't know why I just feel guilty. I go, because you're guilty. I don't know why I feel ashamed. Because you did something you should be ashamed of. God will remove that from you. That isn't what he wants from you. I don't always know what God wants me to do, but if I know what the enemy wants me to do, I'm going to do the I'm going to do the opposite. So let's see what he did so we can do the opposite. Here's the four things that he did not do. He did not guard his heart. He didn't guard his heart. Secondly, his self-talk, the things he said to himself and the thoughts 
that the enemy planted in his mind that he held on to. Number three, the words that he spoke to others. Isn't it ironic that his first recorded words in two Gospels were, what a waste. Number three, the way he spoke to others. Number four, the way he processed hurt, disappointment, and offense. The way he processed hurt, disappointment, listen carefully to me. Every one of us process hurt, disappointment, and offense. Whether you think you process it or not, you process it. You say, well, Pastor, I don't. I just like, I just swallow it and I just hold it in. God put Adam and Eve in the garden, and you know what he told them to do? Tend and keep it. You know what the garden is now? This right here. This right here. So let's go now and unpack these so we can see what he did so we can do the opposite of that. Number one, the words he spoke to himself and the thoughts he allowed. There's two types of talk that go on here, okay? Self-talk, say self-talk. And the other one is Satan talk. The first one is? The second one is? Let me explain what I'm talking about. Let me explain what I'm talking about. You can walk into a church like this and you look over and go, why are they dressed like that? Let's look at them. Didn't they know that are a church? Lord, what did they think they were? Cowboys? The strip? Can't believe somebody walk up into church like that. See the people laughing? That's what they've been saying. <laughs> okay, you look over and they're in church. Uh, <laughs> okay. But then there's thoughts that the enemy plants in your mind. Satan talk. Look at John 13, 2. So it was during supper, read it with me, Satan having already of into the heart of Judas Iscariot. Who put the thought there? Do you know what Satan's biggest plan is? Look right here. It's for him to plan a thought in your mind and try to convince you that it's you. Martin Luther, the Protestant leader of the Reformation in the 1600s, 400 years ago, said this, a bird can fly over you and drop something on you that you can't control. How many of you have ever been, you know, you get all dressed up and you're walking outside, look at that flock of birds. <laughs> Anybody ever had that happen to them? Okay, here's what he said. A bird can fly and drop something on you that you can't control, but you can determine whether a bird builds a nest in your head. You see, the enemy can, can throw things on you. The enemy can poop on you with some bad thoughts. Don't lie. Some of y'all come walking in church. It's like, ooh, she fine. Mm. You know that. Some of y'all sit up here, you know, some guy with a tight shirt in church worshiping. You go, oh, I love to see him worship. God be praised. <laughs> Look at me. The enemy is always busy about planting things. He planted this, but just because he plants it there doesn't mean it has to stay there. You see, it's our job that when self-talk or Satan talk is dropped in our mind that's not from God, that we are to immediately remove that. Because if you plan a thought, you reap a deed. If you plan a deed, you reap a habit. If you plan a habit, you reap a lifestyle. If you plan a lifestyle, you reap a destiny. But it all begins with a, your life is heading in the directions of your greatest thoughts. Your life is heading in the direction of your greatest thoughts. Your life is headed in the direction of your greatest thoughts. So, Pastor, what, what do I do when, when thoughts come into my mind? And, like, I, I don't know if they're from God or not or if they're me. What do I do? Well, you have to have something to compare it to, to decide whether it's true or not. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 10, 4, and 5, and he says, 
Here's what we do with those thoughts. We use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down the what? Strongholds of and to destroy every false argument. We destroy every proud obstacle that keeps us from knowing God, and we capture their rebellious and teach them to. In, in, if you're a carpenter, and I'm not, I serve one, but I don't know much about carpentry. They have a thing called a level. How many of you know what a level is? That's the term we use, level up. Do you know that that actually means a level is this little ladies, it's this thing about like this, and in the middle they have like a little bubble thing, and it has three markers, and when you put it on a wall, it's supposed to be in the middle. If it's in the middle, the wall is level. That's what leveling up is. Our level is the Word of God. So we take God's word and any thought that comes into my mind, I hold it up against the word of God. And if it's against the word of God, it's got to go and it's got to bow. It's got to go and it's got to bow. But pastor, is that easy for you? You know what it's like? It's, it's like windshield wipers when you're driving and all of a sudden, how many remember love bug season? I don't know why they call them love bugs. I hate those bugs. How many of you know what I'm talking about? And you're driving, you're driving, and you just washed your truck. I'll say, Psh! what do you do? You could look over at your wife and go, oh, it's love bug season, baby. Let's just live that on there. Why? Because another one's going to replace it. Well, do you do that? What do you do? You push that little, Psh! Psh! water comes up. Psh! 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 You go a little farther, one comes up. Psh! What do you do? And do you know what you do with the thoughts that come to your mind? You compare them to the Word of God. And what's not of the Word of God, you cast down and make it bow in obedience to Christ. Because ultimately what you allow to stay right here, what you allow to stay right here before anybody ever committed adultery, before anybody ever murdered, before anybody ever cursed somebody out, before anybody ever stole, before anybody ever did any of those things. Look at me. It came right here. And when it got right here, instead of holding up the level of the word of God, instead they allowed it to stay there until the thought ultimately became a habit, an action, a lifestyle. And now you look at a person and go, see him, he's a drunk. See him, he's an addict. See her, she's nasty Nikki. He drunk Donald. Donald, I'm not talking about you. <laughs> okay. Your self-talk and Satan talk. You know, one of the most concerning things to me is too many of us have one-way conversations with the devil, and it's him talking and not us. I talk to the devil all the time. I hate him. I tell him all the time. Donald and I did a funeral yesterday for somebody that took his life. I hate the devil. I hate the devil. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy, and I hate him. And when his thoughts come and throw up on the screen of my mind, I tell him that I hate him, and I rebuke him in the name of Jesus. And every time he comes back, I just keep doing it. And every time he comes back, I do it. And then you know what ultimately ends up happening? H. Here's what happens. You know how when you get the real nice cars, like the one I'm driving, rain comes on there and I don't even have to turn them on. It just comes on natural. <laughs> you end up doing this so long that literally it becomes second nature because the word of God begins to rule your mind and no stronghold can be built because they've been broken and they're no longer welcome anymore. Number two, he didn't allow the word of God to guard his heart. He didn't allow the word of God to, I remember when I became a Christian. I became a Christian during the Jesus movement. And you might find it hard to believe, but people look like they look now. Long hair and tattoos. Earrings. Just like, you know, what weed does to you. Like, hey, what up? Hey, wow, wow. Uh, back in the day. How many were back there in the day? Come on. And when I gave my life to Jesus and I started preaching to all of these people, you know what they would tell me? Dude, dude, dude. That was a word. Dude, you got brainwashed. 
you got brainwashed. How many of you ever been told you got brainwashed? You know what I told him? You're right. If you knew it was in my brain, say it loud. And can I tell you this? So did yours. You are cleansed through the word which I have spoken to you. You and I need to be brainwashed. David wrote in Psalms 119 verse 11, Your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. That word is that regulator that gives me the power to continue to wash those things away every single time they come up. Number three, the words he spoke to others. Proverbs 18, 21 says, the power of life and death are in the tongue. Many years ago, I had a youth group. Baby, this was before you. About 19. I had it going on. I'm going to be honest with y'all. And I'm in the pool, and the uh, youth group was there in Victoria, Texas, and, and this little girl next to me was kind of trying to be a little impressive, you know, like she had a little babe on. And somebody jumped in the pool and clipped her on the shoulder, and she went, bah! and yelled out a curse word. And I looked at her and she went, Jacob, I don't know where that came from. And I said, I do. Where? I said, it came from your mouth. (laughs) And before that, it came from your, because the Bible says out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. See, see, whatever's in here is like knocking over a glass. That, that, that's what comes out. How many conversations did Judas have in his mind? I don't believe that. I can't believe that happened. Why is he doing that? I'm not sure if that's real. Can you imagine being with Jesus, knowing that he knew everything and you got enough gall to steal money from the money bag? I got the free songs thinking about it. Here's the final one. The way he handled hurt, disappointment, and offense. One of the titles of the devil is the accuser of the brethren. Like when you go to a club, he doesn't accuse those people. Like like when Nasty Nicky calls you on a Friday night. Like Nasty Nicky, and he pops up. The devil doesn't go, that's Nasty Nicky, don't answer. You know what she's going to do. Look at, th- he doesn't do that. When Smoking Weed Willie calls you. Okay, the devil doesn't say, don't answer that. You know he's stupid. He's always just so, he don't even have a job. Man, do you see how ugly those tattoos are? Yeah, he's a mess. The devil doesn't do that. But walk in church. Look at that hypocrite on the third row. He is the accuser of the brethren. It's people that can help you, he accuses, not people that can hurt you. I wish I was preaching in Youngsville. I think they would have clapped right there. Abbeville is clapping right now. What do I do when I get hurt, Pastor Jacob, when I get offended? Anybody get offended? Okay, what do I do, Pastor, then? Because I I don't want to become Judas. You process up. Say that with me. You process. One more time. You process. You process up. You know, when your parents, your parents, and you correct one of the teenagers, okay, and they go to their other siblings. I can't believe mom and dad are always up on top of us. They get all over us. They get off us. I can't wait. I get out of the house. And they leave me alone. They get out of my life. They go quit bothering me. Okay. That's till you pack up everything in their suitcase and say, get your butt out of here. They go, where will I go? Watch. It's the accuser. When we get hurt, and all of us do. How many of you have hurt someone and you didn't mean to? Now we're going to get the real honest ones. How many of you hurt some people and you meant to hurt them? Well, it's the same people. It's a rough crowd. <laughs> look, look, look at me. Look at me. How do you process pain? Hurt. Disappointment. 
You know, the devil put it in Judas's heart with a why. Why? You know, everybody here got a why. Why did mama die? Why did my daddy leave? Why did my parents get divorced? Why did my teenagers do that? Why did my teenagers do that? Why did my teenagers? <laughs> Everybody's got a why. But look at me. You can process your why up or you can process it down. Now I'm going to give you an example of somebody who processed up and then we're going to close. Here it is. Who was Jesus' first cousin that baptized him? Okay. When Jesus went to John, when John was preaching, Jesus goes up and John looks at him when he walks up and says, Behold, the Lamb of God, that takes away the sin of the world. Jesus walks up and he says, Baptize me. And John says, I, I need to be baptized by you. And Jesus says, No. It is needful for you to baptize me. And he baptizes Jesus. And when Jesus comes up out of the water, what happens? God speaks from heaven and says, This is my beloved son in whom I'm pleased. This is my beloved son in whom I'm pleased. And then the Holy Spirit descends like a on Jesus. How many think that'd be hard to forget for the rest of your life? Well, let me tell you what happened to John not long after that. One of the people that came out was one of the Roman rulers who had taken his brother's wife. All the people were coming to hear John, and so John looked at him and said, You, you've taken your brother's wife, and it's wrong. Repent. And this woman living in adultery started to hate John. And so she had her ruler, immoral husband, put him in prison. A few weeks later, there was a big party that he threw. And her daughter began to do a striptease. They were drunk. All of his friends were there. It was so exciting and intoxicating that he jumped up drunk and said, I'll give you anything you want up to half of my kingdom. What do you want? And she goes to her mama, what do I ask for? And you know what her mama said? Ask for the head of John the Baptist cut off, put on a silver platter, brought to you. That's how John died, over that. He's in prison now. This hasn't happened yet. He's lonely. He's despondent. He's discouraged. And he sends Two of his disciples that came to see him to Jesus and said, go ask him, are you really the Christ? Are you really the one? Didn't he hear the audible voice of God? Didn't he see a dove come from heaven? But when you're down and you're discouraged... You start doubting everything that you believed before. Even the miracles that you saw, you start doubting and you start questioning. Look right here. Be careful how you process hurt and disappointment. Because those things began to be processed in conversations in the heart of Judas. And when you have unforgiveness in your heart, you pull up a chair to the devil going, come and sit down right here because there's only one person that can never be forgiven. He's the unforgiven one and he's the accuser. And he will come and sit right down beside you and tell you everything wrong with every single person in the world but you. But you. Now, you know what's really shocking? You know who the first Judas was? He was in charge of worship in heaven. He sat right next to the throne of God and led the choirs of angels in worship to God. Do you know what his name was? Lucifer. You know who he became? 
Satan. And when he fell, one third of the angels fell with him and they became spirits without bodies. They're now demons and they're leading a war against the object of God's greatest love and affection. And you know who that is? You and me. The first Judas was Satan. He was Satan. Now, I, I want to ask you just a simple question. How, how many of you know that Jesus is living inside of you? How many of you know that sometimes Judas tries, the old Judas tries to rise up in areas of your life? Yeah. Through self-talk, through Satan talk. Look at me. I, I want to be sure. I want to be sure that I don't, I don't do what he did. I want to be sure that I do guard my heart with the word of God. I want to be sure that my self-talk, I don't allow Satan in there and that I speak to him. I want to be sure that my words line up with God's words. And I want to be sure that when I'm hurt, I process with Jesus and his friends and not somebody else. Final story. The most famous Christian picture of all times is the Last Supper. How many of you have seen a picture of the Last Supper? How many of you have one at your mama's house? How many of you have ever sat in a Catholic church and seen a picture of the Last Supper on the wall and you're sitting there and look like you're trying to figure out if they're looking at you? You keep moving like this and turn your head like this. I mean, you know what I'm talking about. Do you know who drew the picture of the Last Supper? It took several years. Anybody know? Leonardo da Vinci. He was the Elon Musk of his time. He was the designer and a creator and an inventor and an artist. He drew the Last Supper and it took years. The first person that he drew was Jesus. And then he began drawing, and it, it, it would literally took years. It was on a wall. The final person that he had that he couldn't figure out who it would be was Judas. And so he was looking for the right person, the right model, and years had gone by, and one day he was walking down the street, and he saw a man. He goes, you, it's you. It was a man who looked like life had been very hard to him. He, he was, his eyes were sunken. He, he looked like he had a rough, rough go of life. And Leonardo da Vinci brought him, and he sat there as he drew him as the final picture, Judas. And when he got through, the man stood up and said, don't you remember me? He goes, what do you mean? He said, well, a lot of things bad have happened to me and a lot of terrible things I've done to myself. But I'm already in your picture. I was Jesus. Jesus and Judas were the same people at different parts of their lives. And my prayer for me, as well as every person here, Jesus Come live fully through me and let me identify when the enemy wants to put Judas on me so that I can be all that you've called me to be by grace and not all that the enemy has scarred me with through the course of my life. Would you bow with me, Father? Thank you for your word. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. Thank you that your word is sharp and powerful, that it speaks to us in moments like this. For you remind us that not only are you the resurrected Christ living by grace inside of us, but there's part of me that I got to speak to every day and the enemy who will continue throwing things at me, but I must use your word and be skillfully equipped to deal with him. Jesus, just like you did in the wilderness, you spoke the word to him. You spoke the word to him. You were Jesus, God in the flesh, but you spoke the word. And that's what we must do.
to hold up that standard. That level. I want everyone just to open up your hands, if you would, on your lap. Just lay your palms out. And just pray this with me. Holy Spirit, wash me. Cleanse me. I want your word to guard my heart. I want to submit to your will and not the enemy's proddings. I want to hide my word in your word in my heart to my words become your words. Today, I don't want any of Judas in me. I want all of Jesus in me. All of Jesus in me. All of Jesus in me. And now with every head bowed, every eye closed, I want to ask you the most important question of your life. Jesus said, unless a man or woman was born again, they wouldn't see the kingdom of God. Jesus said, unless a man or woman was born again, they wouldn't enter into the kingdom of God. Have you been born again? You say, Pastor, what does that mean? I've been christened, I've been baptized, I've joined the church. That's a good start, but that's not what Jesus said. Jesus said in John chapter 3 to a very religious man named Nicodemus, unless you're born again, you won't see the kingdom. Unless you're born again, you won't enter into the kingdom. Every person born since Adam and Eve has been born spiritually dead. And you and I are spiritually dead until we become born again and we become raised from the spiritually dead in Christ. Just like Easter when he was raised. So if you're here today and you say, Pastor, I believe in God and I believe in Jesus, but I've never prayed to be born again. Would you pray for me today, Pastor? I want to be born again today. I want to know God. I want to surrender to his amazing love. I'm going to count to three. If that's you on the count of three, raise your hand so I can pray for you right at your seat. I won't embarrass you. I'm just going to pray for you right where you are. One, God brought you here. Yes, he brought you. Two, isn't it time? Is it time to stop running and to surrender to the one that loves you so much? The one that's pursued you all of your life relentlessly. And he is now. And now's your moment to surrender to that love to be born again. It only happens once, just like the day you were born. And now here's your moment. If that's you, when I say three, I want you to raise your hand to say, pray for me, Pastor. I've never prayed to be born again. Today I want to pray to be born again. Three, if that's you, lift it high. Lift it high. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. All right. You can put your hands down. The church, let's pray out loud with all of those that raise their hand to be born again today. Let's pray out loud with them. Dear Lord Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. I believe that on the cross, you took my guilt, my sin, and my shame, and you died for it. I believe you faced hell for me so I would not have to go. And you rose from the dead to give me a place in heaven, a purpose on earth, and a relationship with your Father. Today, Lord Jesus, I turn away from sin to be born again. Today, God is my Father, Jesus is my Savior, and I'm born again in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, can we put our hands together for those who prayed the prayer to be born again? Amen. Hey, listen, if you prayed that prayer to be born again, your next step is water baptism. So listen, before you leave, I know a lot of people are stirred. Before you leave, make sure you indicate on that card that you just gave your life to Christ so that we can follow up with you on water baptism. If you will, go ahead and stand to your feet. And as always, our prayer team will be down front if you would like to receive prayer after the service. Receive this blessing before you leave. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you, and may he make his face shine upon you and give you peace. And may he bless you in your going out and coming in, and all that you set your hand to for his kingdom. May he prosper it, and may he bless it. Now I bless you in the name of the Father, his Son, Jesus, and the all-abiding Holy Spirit. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, and the church said a good. Amen. God bless.